My guest today is Noam Bramson, ever vital, charismatic mayor of New Rochelle, the queen city on the sound. New Rochelle is a 25-minute Metro North train ride from Grand Central Station. With Mary Tyler Moore's recent passing, I kept thinking about the Dick Van Dyke show and how the TV characters Rob and Laura Petrie lived in New Rochelle. My college roommate's family also lived there, and when life was just too much, we too trained to this haven for an evening of comfort in her lovely home and maybe a short trip downtown for ice cream. For a young girl from Brooklyn, New Rochelle was a dream. The city has struggled through some difficult times, and its leaders have sought creative revitalization opportunities. New Rochelle may have been the first Westchester community to welcome a Trump Tower. New Rock City may have been the first 18 theater multiplex and entertainment center in Westchester. Big box stores like Costco and Home Depot were welcomed. Avalon Apartments brought back some vitality to downtown. But other development plans have waxed and waned. I've heard much about new cultural and development plans for New Rochelle, and I wanted to know more about them. Mayor Noam Bramson is here today to tell us about these new plans. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town and Village Two. Welcome back. Noam, thanks so much for being my guest. I really appreciate it, and we have so much to talk about. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Alice. Well, let me start by congratulating you on the bond rating New Rochelle received. We're, we're very pleased. Uh, we uh, just received word that New Rochelle has its highest bond rating in more than 80 years, and uh, that's a nice marker that indicates our improving fiscal position, and I think it's a credit to members of our staff and the community who all work together, especially through the difficult years of the recession. Uh, to make sure that uh, we could keep our fiscal house in order. And uh, the, the benefit of it, of course, is that it will reduce borrowing costs for taxpayers and enable us to fund important things like our 10-year capital program. Well, I want to know more about that, but I also want to know how you restored that bond rating because New Rochelle has been through some challenging times. I mean, when I first moved here in the early 80s, Mm, the downtown was just starting to fray, but there was Bloomingdale's downtown and a pretty vital set of retail stores. The mall was the mall, and I don't think that was particularly fabulous, but it was it was fine. There was Macy's there and re real stores. And then you went through a tough time where there was a real decline in the downtown. Do you see the upswing now? Uh, I really do, and I, I just to go back to sort of this historical uh, experience, uh, I would say that uh, Nurshell's downtown began its decline in the immediate post-war years. And, and it wasn't really evident then because there was still a great deal of vibrancy. It was one of the retail centers uh, of Westchester County. But in retrospect, uh, we can see that the, the writing was on the wall. And in fact, Nurshell is similar to many what they call first suburbs. This is in the inner ring of a metropolitan area, aging infrastructure, uh, transition to the car culture, shifts of population. Uh, and all of that resulted in our downtown kind of bottoming out in the early 1990s. Uh, at the time, the New Rochelle Mall had closed. We had rubble-strewn vacant lots next to our train station. Uh, and since that time, the, the city has pursued an aggressive strategy of transit-oriented development, which is really just sort of a fancy way of saying build near the train station. Okay, I was going to ask. <laughs> uh, but it's the term that many planners uh, will use. And that has borne some fruit. Uh, over the last 20 years, as your introduction indicated, uh, we've seen the injection of new high-quality housing, a new entertainment center and movie theaters. There's been a growth in our restaurant and artistic scene, but still not the kind of critical mass that injects life and energy and appeal into a downtown area as a whole. Uh, there are still significant gaps. Uh, the uh, commercial and retail base is not as strong as we'd like it to be. And ideally, downtown New Rochelle should be a magnet for the full spectrum of our own population and for the population of the region as a Do whole. Do you think it's more, um, I don't know, fear from uh, some illusion of danger? I mean, I don't ever understand. Here you have access to the water. You've got these beautiful waterfront areas. You've got the north end with very lovely suburbs, subdivisions. I mean, beautiful ho housing. And you've got downtown where you can get off the train, and you've got a new train station with a parking structure for those people who wish to park. And you, you can get off the train, and you're right downtown at the Avalon uh, restaurants. I mean, it's easier than getting some places in Manhattan, that's uh, for sure. You're right, and uh, what your question uh, makes clear, and I agree 100%, is that the community's core assets are remarkable. Uh, our location, uh, our basic structure, our transit uh, assets, 
Um, our human population, which is remarkably diverse and talented, our access to the waterfront, and yet we have fallen short of our potential. And so let me talk about what we're trying to accomplish now and, and why I'm so excited looking ahead. Uh, at the end of 2015, the City Council, after a, a year-long process, adopted a comprehensive plan, framework, uh, for downtown development. Uh, and it has three essential components. One is a partnership with a master development team. This is a group called RDRXR, that's Renaissance Downtowns and RXR Realty. And they now have an exclusive on about a dozen publicly owned sites in the downtown area. What does that mean that they have an exclusive? Have they purchased them? Uh, there is a mechanism through which they can purchase them. Okay. And those are mainly parking areas that are presently under the city's control. Uh, they will have to meet certain tests in order to take title to those areas. But it's important because on those sites, RxR and RD, which well-capitalized, highly regarded firm, uh, will be able to undertake catalytic developments that will help strengthen the downtown as a whole. And their involvement also sends a signal to the broader marketplace that the water's fine, come on in. Uh, here's a major real estate entity that's making a play in New Rochelle, that has confidence in New Rochelle, uh, and uh, we think that's important. But that's only one piece of it. Uh, because at the same time, we have adopted a new overlay zone for the downtown. It's something called a form-based code, which means that it is very flexible when it comes to use. It can be market responsive, but very prescriptive when it comes to design. So everything from the amount of glazing at the ground level to upper level setbacks to attention to what are called significant vistas or uh, terminal corners, rather terminal vistas, significant <laughs> corners, uh, all those things are embedded in the zoning code. And, and the idea is to make sure that the evolving physical fabric of the downtown is one that is appealing to people who are walking down the street, to pedestrians, to those who are viewing the city from afar or from up close. And the third piece is a completed environmental review. Uh, now, those who have um, any experience with the New York State's Environmental Quality Review Act know that on the one hand, it's enormously valuable in evaluating uh, project impacts, but it also cumbersome, time-consuming, expensive. So, Isn't by is there a fast track? Well, uh, no, unless you do what we've done, which is complete a generic environmental review for our entire build-out plan. Uh, have that subject to uh, the normal public hearing process, to approval by the City Council. And now, as a consequence, specific projects that are consistent with that vision do not need to undertake their own environmental impact statement. So that wipes away what would otherwise be very significant financial and procedural obstacles. And that has passed muster, legal muster? I'm yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it involved a significant upfront investment of time, energy, and resources. But we think it's now going to pay off because it makes New Rochelle a much more appealing investment prospect. And sure enough, since the adoption of the plan in late 2015, we've seen uh, an order of magnitude increase in uh, the level of interest. And um, uh, you know, every day the phone is ringing in our Department of Development. There are more than a dozen sites that are at various stages of uh, project review. Uh, the largest of them so far is RDRXR's first project. It'll be a 28-story tower uh, at the site of the former Lowe's Theater. And at the ground level, it include, will include a black box performance space, which I think will inject some cultural energy into that portion of the Let's downtown. Back up for, well, for, now, for those of us who haven't driven down the street in a while, the, the old theater, which hasn't been open in 20 years? Well, it was, a, it was a nightclub for a while, but that was maybe 12 or 13 so years that's ago. That's on Main Street. Yes. It actually straddles Main and Huguenot. It connects okay. the two. Uh, so it's a, it's a very large site at the western portion of our downtown, uh, which has not received a significant amount of investment up till now and we think will become uh, an anchor and a stimulus for a, a positive change in that area. And again, that's just one of many projects that we expect will unfold. I'm painfully aware that uh, there is a larger economic cycle that creates windows of opportunity, and we don't know when that window is going to close on and us. And right now, it's pretty uh, advantageous. Yes. Uh, interest rates are very low. Exactly. And that has compelled development. Certainly, New York City is overwhelmingly being developed. I mean, walking down the street, it's like, hold your, you know, cover your head mm -hmm. because there's building all over. But I want to back up for a little bit for those people who aren't quite as conversant in the land use terms. Are you suggesting that downtown is going to be um, mixed use? Yes. So um, the, the overall uh, plan, uh, the overall vision that we articulated um, in multiple documents, including that environmental review, calls for about 6,000 new housing units, for several million square feet of new office and retail space, for new hotel rooms, 
Um, so uh, we wanted to have this kind of mixed-use composition uh, which allows one use to strengthen the other use and overall create a sort of balanced environment. The timetable and sequence during which those different elements will be developed will be very much market dependent. So it's well and good for us to say, thou shalt construct 200,000 square feet of office space at this location, but unless there's a market for it, it's not going to happen. Exactly. So the framework has to be specific enough to make our ambitions clear and to make those uh, approvable through the environmental review, but flexible enough to allow the market to operate on its own timetable. And we think we've, we've hit that sweet spot. And, and again, the reaction so far from the investment community has been very exciting. Who would be attracted to locate their offices in New Rochelle? Who uh, is not presently there? Well, uh, anyone coming back to the core assets we mentioned earlier, who was interested in being able to get easily to Manhattan in 30 minutes, uh, easily to LaGuardia or Westchester airports in less than 30 minutes, uh, easy access to Stanford or, or White Plains or the other uh, commercial centers uh, in the area. Uh, anyone uh, who is interested in having a, a talented workforce from which they can draw, a community which has three colleges, a uh, community which uh, features a high quality of life in terms of uh, uh, a remarkable spectrum of neighborhoods, many of which have history and charm, an excellent public school system, so all of these terrific assets and a, a cost structure that is likely to be significantly lower than what you would find uh, in certainly in Manhattan or other areas with which we are competing. But we recognize that our plans are not as mature as they might be in, in other areas, that the potential has not yet been realized. So I sometimes liken New Rochelle to a, a value stock. And if you can recognize that the upside potential is enormous, uh, then, uh, then you want to get in. Okay, I want to play devil's advocate. How do you reach those potential relocators? Do you wait for them to come to you, or is there an outreach program now? Both. Uh, so uh, we've been quite aggressive since the adoption of our plan in sharing information in multiple contexts. Uh, we share it through direct distribution. We share it by attending uh, meetings, uh, speaking uh, in, in panel discussions, uh, otherwise presenting to interested constituencies uh, in the business community um, and sometimes in intermunicipal gatherings as well. It's helpful to talk about the Nourishell story. Uh, we also undertook a, a branding exercise uh, that ran concurrent with our, our, the development of our downtown plan uh, that came up with the strap line, Ideally Yours, as well as a logo. And I expect that during the course of this year, we're going to be rolling that out more aggressively. Uh, so you'll see an effort to, uh, to brand New Rochelle in the public mind. Uh, that will be enormously helpful. Uh, in addition, when we have specific sites over which we have direct control, such as our downtown firehouse at 45 Harrison Street, uh, we just issued a request for proposals uh, for uh, possible development there. So uh, meaning you're going to eliminate the firehouse? Uh, meaning it would either be uh, uh, reincorporated into a new development, or recited nearby. It, it is probable that a significant investment will have to be made, and it makes sense to look at that as an opportunity uh, to take the site and use it for maximum public benefit. So, how does uh, the tax structure fit into their plans? I mean, in Westchester is a pretty high tax area. It's a factor, certainly, and. Um, even though uh, it is unpopular in certain quarters, we've made clear that we will almost certainly have to offer tax incentives in order to be competitive. But, and this is quite important, uh, we've also made clear that the downtown plan in its totality has to be a net positive for taxpayers. That is, when we compare the new revenue that's generated uh, against the uh, extra costs we may have in service delivery, uh, we have to come out ahead. Um, and uh, that basic commitment will inform any particular tax deal that we offer. And in fact, we came up with a very creative mechanism called a fair share mitigation fund. So in addition to annual payments that will be made by all of these developments, they will be required to make a one-time payment based on a per square footage formula that will pay for capital needs that may be associated with, as we mentioned, a new firehouse mm -hmm. or new fire equipment, and very importantly, public schools. Uh, 6,000 housing units will generate a certain number of, uh, of uh, public school students. And uh, we went through an extensive exercise looking at the, uh, the capacity of our different school buildings, uh, existing demographic trends, layering the projections associated with development on top of that to determine what sort of school expansion or construction might be necessary, and then make sure that developers are paying their fair share for it. 
Um, and uh, in addition to being reasonable and uh, um, uh, respectful of taxpayer interests, it also provides a level of predictability uh, for developers. They will know right up front what their bill is going to be. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that degree of predictability is, I think, also important in, in making us competitive. Now, was a municipality always able to extract that kind of commitment from a developer? Yeah, there was no legal restraint on doing so. But to the best of my knowledge, we are the first ones to come up with a comprehensive formula of, of this kind. And uh, look, you learn from both the successes and mistakes of the past. Um, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, I think that New Rochelle has advanced the ball significantly over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. But there are still some things we recognize were not done as well as they could have been. And we want to make sure we incorporate those lessons going well, forward. Well, learning is a, is a good thing. I mean, I, I remember when Avalon went in, and mm -hmm. when the first building went in, it was a great improvement. Certainly downtown brought a lot of people downtown. But I guess there were incentives that were built into even the second structure yeah. that New Rochelle had to abide by. So can I say, I think, the, for me, yeah. The even bigger lesson of what went right and what went wrong with Avalon um, is, is not so much the financial impacts, although that is important. It's the design considerations. Um, if you look at how those buildings uh, are structured, uh, you've got a, a large parking garage that separates the residential building from the commercial fabric uh, to its south. And then the buildings themselves retreat from the road. There's sort of a, a rotary that uh, surrounds them in front. So you don't have that continuous urban street line. And as a result, the commercial spaces within the buildings get kind of orphaned and are hard to lease. So I mentioned earlier the, uh, the form-based zoning code that we've adopted. Under the new code, that design would not be permissible. Uh, the, the structure of the buildings would have to integrate much more fully with our existing street fabric. And I think that, as much as anything else, um, is uh, an example of a lesson learned that will pay dividends going forward. I mean, we, we know now, not just Nourishell, planners generally, we know from innumerable experiences around the country what works and what doesn't work. And by embedding uh, those, uh, those guidelines, embedding those, that wisdom uh, in our zoning code, I think we can ensure that Nourishell will evolve in a positive direction for the next few decades. But aren't these styles things that wax and wane? For example, setbacks are considered a good thing sometimes, and then the the attitude changes, and now we want everything, all our streets, uh, buildings to be uniform, and uh, for people on the sidewalk to be able to easily access the, mm. store, the stores and, and commercial spaces. I mean, it makes good sense, but then there comes the interest in public spaces, and people want a place where they can have lunch, mm -hmm. or you know, you come out of your office and you want to just be outdoors for a while. You make a good point, and. Um, we should never confuse uh, passing fashion with permanent wisdom. Uh, so I, I get what you're saying, but I, I would say that the, the elements in the zoning code really do reflect not the, the flavor of the month, but the accumulated wisdom from several decades of observing cities, building cities, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And a lot of it is based on common sense. You know, when we walk down a street, we often have an instinctive sense of what is an appealing and not appealing environment even if we can't necessarily articulate why we feel that way. And yet, when you drill down, you can pretty much determine what is going to drive people's psychology. It, it is the, um, the, the ratio of height to width of the street. Mm -hmm. It is the degree to which there are gaps or no gaps. Uh, it is, um, it's the way the public and private realm relate to each other that largely shapes how we feel in an urban environment. And um, uh, I think uh, we can do better than we have on that, on that score, and we will. So, if I understand you correctly, you're going to maintain the sense of walkability. Yes. I mean, that's a psychobabble term, I guess. Or no, <laughs> it's more than psychobabble. I mean, there are a lot of buzzwords in this Right. Field. But the point is that people can walk from here to there. Because I often thought, I mean, as a person who formerly lived in the city and moved to the suburbs, I always valued walkability. And that's one of the reasons I liked New Rochelle. I liked my Marinette. You park your car once and you can yeah. walk to the post office, to the, you know, the luncheonette, to the hairdresser, to the toy store. I mean, all the, take yeah. care of all the things that you need to do in an afternoon, perhaps. And especially if you have young children in tow. So let me, you're 100% right. And, and let me put this in a bigger context, if I could. So walkability, um, and you, I think, defined it very well, I'd add to that. Uh, in sort of a reverse way, lack of dependence on a car uh, is one of the key qualities that the millennial generation, uh, by all accounts, is looking for in determining where do I want to live and where do I want to work. And so um, if we look at the sort of the New York metropolitan area broadly, 
folks who study this thing for a living have concluded that the area needs to grow by about 4 million people and 2 million jobs in order to really hit its stride and be competitive on the global stage. The five boroughs alone cannot realistically absorb that kind of growth. And so it is places like New Rochelle and White Plains and Yonkers and, and elsewhere um, which have this good transit access, which are within the orbit of, of, the, uh, of the center city, which need to step up and, uh, and be a part of this overall regional growth picture. And so by emphasizing qualities that will make downtown New Rochelle a place where our kids and grandkids want to live and can afford to live, we do right by ourselves because we'll have a stronger tax base and a more appealing community. And we do right by the New York metropolitan area as a whole by enhancing the competitiveness of our region. So how have you succeeded in attracting millennials who are more inclined to be in Brooklyn or Manhattan? Lower costs. Okay. Lower costs. I mean, okay. you know, and frankly, as you pointed out earlier, uh, you can make a good case that uh, New Rochelle is, uh, it's easier to get to midtown Manhattan from New Rochelle than it is from many parts of Brooklyn. And uh, as our downtown evolves, as its cultural energy and dining options uh, continue to a flourish, uh, we will be able to offer a high quality of life at a fraction of the price. And, uh, and that's our competitive edge. And, and sure enough, we're seeing that. I mean, we, we still have a ways to go in terms of our commercial and retail base. We recognize that's going to be somewhat harder to achieve, but on the residential front, uh, we've enjoyed great success. And I expect that we will continue to enjoy success. And that, in turn, helps make it an easier sell for the retail and, and commercial presence. How do you overcome the resistance to the railroad? And I say resistance because I have young adult kids and they think nothing of getting on the subway, but the subway runs 24 hours and it may be a little slower at night, but they don't have to keep to a schedule. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the challenges of Metro North. While Metro North, I mean, I have to say, especially the New Haven line is extremely reliable. You still have to keep to a schedule. And if you miss the last train, you're going to wait an hour. Well. Um, Usually, you don't have to wait an hour. I mean, certainly like during late at night during commuting. Yes, yeah. late at night yeah. during commuting times, they arrive with great frequency. Yeah. And even outside commuting times, I think it's usually about every half hour. Well, I think it's like wonderful, but I, I just get the comments from young adults. Yeah. Oh, I have to. Yeah. What do you mean I have to be there at twelve ten or whatever time? There actually is a uh, a group in New York City which is advocating for the expansion of the subway system into Lower Westchester. Yeah. Now, I I'm not holding my breath for that. Right. Uh, so your your point is well taken. Uh, no place is perfect, but we think that uh, the combination of costs and benefits that New Rochelle offers, and again, that other urban centers in Westchester mm -hmm. do offer or can offer, is very appealing and very attractive well, and, and also, will become more so. And you're also closer to the city. I mean, 25 minutes, I mean, you really, in New York, to get from anywhere to anywhere else, you, you count on a half hour to 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, so you do that. Let's talk more specifics. I know there have been plans for Echo Bay. Mm -hmm. Echo Bay, of course, as we're driving um, from, we'll say, Larchmont, Mamaroneck, on your left, access to the water that most people don't even know about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, it, it, this is something that's been the subject of controversy in the past in New Rochelle. Mm -hmm. There was a, a project that was um, almost approved, but ultimately uh, turned down by the uh, city council amid a fair amount of public objection. Uh, I was disappointed by the, how that turned out, but uh, you don't look back, you look ahead. And the good news is we now have another bite at the apple. And in fact, I think we have a, a better chance now to accomplish our goals than before. So number one, the city council uh, unanimously approved the relocation of our public works yard, which is presently on the site. Uh, that was the single biggest obstacle to opening up our and waterfront. And where will that go? Uh, it'll go within the Home Depot Costco retail okay. complex. Perfect. There's a sort of an unused site for it, uh, and it's going to be a public-private partnership to uh, accomplish that. Uh, so um, what had been this huge obstacle is now uh, going to be removed. What about the armory? Or, the armory is, is going to be adaptively reused and preserved okay. in the context of an overall redevelopment. That's, that's the plan. And uh, we're now working with a group uh, called Twining Properties, um, uh, and they have come forward with a, a new vision for the site. And in fact, um, uh, in, uh, in the month of February, uh, the City Council will be considering a memorandum of understanding with Twining, which will be the, sort of the next step in this process. And if the Council uh, elects to proceed, then we'll be on track to, uh, to do something pretty and remarkable on the waterfront. Are you looking for residential? Uh, again, mixed use. Uh, the, the Twining plan calls for, I believe, 80 to 100,000 square feet, uh, give or take of uh, retail space, uh, residential and hotel uses on uh, upper levels, um, uh, and a continuous waterfront promenade that would be uh, entirely accessible to the public. Uh, compared to the, the prior plan, 
Uh, it, is, uh, it has a more dense and active uh, feel, uh, a little bit less parkland, but uh, more in the way of sort of active features that people may find uh, appealing. Like it, what, what is active? Uh, well, um, the, the quantity of retail, for example, is considerably mm -hmm. higher. Um, and uh, and will continue all the way down to the water's edge, as opposed to stopping closer so to Main Street. So, what would you be using? What would you be emulating? A Maryland, like a Baltimore situation, like the harbor there? Yeah, you know, I, I that's one possible like analogy. I, I kind of think of it a little bit, um, and I want to be careful because people may get the wrong impression. A lower scale battery park city. There are no high rises that are proposed, uh, but um, you, you know, there's this sort of um, uh, the public promenade. Uh, with retail interspersed throughout it and, uh, and residential buildings um, uh, that uh, sort of dominate the upper levels. Um, the renderings are available online on, on the city website so you can get a sense of what it is that we're aiming for. I think it's important to think of it as the place where the downtown meets the shore. Uh, and, and indeed, it is literally the location uh, at which it is possible to walk from the downtown to the waterfront. Right, it's, a, it's two blocks. I mean, it's really a short walk. How do you cope with the waste treatment plant? Is there any expectation of moving that, or will that remain in place? It'll remain in place, and in fact, the upgrades that were recently completed are helpful. There are far better odor control mechanisms in place. Uh, the design of the plant, although there are limits to how much lipstick you put on that pig, uh, but it's still better than it used to be. Um, and while it's not uh, the ideal neighbor for waterfront development, uh, folks who are professionals who have looked at it do not consider it a major impediment. So okay. I think we'll be fine on that front. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm enormously optimistic that, that this is going to happen. Okay. Nothing well, sure until well, it's done, but we're on before, a good track. But we'll, we'll, we'll keep getting you back. I mean, good. we'll hold your feet to the fire. We have only a minute left. I can't help but ask how you are coping with our current uh, political climate. I think you have been very, very uh, out front, very vocal about declaring New Rochelle as sanctuary city. Well, we haven't used that term, okay. um, uh, which doesn't have a precise definition. No. But we have made it very clear that uh, we respect, value, and welcome our immigrant community. And we think it's a terrible mistake to employ local law enforcement in the immigration enforcement business. We think that diminishes public safety. And more broadly, I will say that uh, the excitement and optimism I feel about everything that's happening at the local level finds its sort of inverted mirror image when I look at what's happening nationally. It is deeply distressing uh, to see the direction that the new administration is pursuing. Uh, I think in many respects it betrays deeply held, hard-won American values. And uh, I think you're beginning to see in the reaction from uh, the public that um, the administration has badly misread uh, the mood of this country, that we are better than the policies and the, uh, the notions that are coming out of the Trump White House. Are you enjoying support from your colleagues in neighboring communities in expressing those feelings? Yes, I think, and look, uh, there's no such thing as unanimity on any subject, certainly not on this, but uh, I think most of the leadership of the municipalities in Westchester uh, would echo some version of what I've just said. Uh, and remember, uh, uh, the president did not do well in these parts, um, so uh, he may have carried the electoral vote nationwide, and he is our president, uh, but uh, clearly the people in New Rochelle and in Westchester County wanted to move in a different direction, and even though we respect, of course, uh, the, the orderly transfer of power and the lines of authority, uh, we don't uh, sacrifice our values because one party or another party wins or loses. Uh, those values endure and need to be upheld. Well, I commend you for your courage, and I look forward to seeing uh, you and your colleagues in the coming days oppose what you find reprehensible. Thank you, no, Thank you so much for being my guest. It's my always pleasure. a pleasure, and we'll have you back again soon to talk about how you're proceeding with New Rochelle's expansion plans. Sounds good. Thank you. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town in Village 2. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.